This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. You bet. Energy in America, Lou Pugliarisi in Washington, and me, Jay Fidel here in Honolulu, talking about energy in America. More specifically, we're talking about the U.S. interagency uh, client assessment. Uh, is it a real crisis or, a, or is it doomsday mongering? Whoa. <laughs> Hi, Lou. Hi, how you doing, Jay? Pretty good. It's quite cold here in Washington today, so. <laughs> we, are, we are less than sympathetic, what can I tell you? <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think it's, there's been enormous media coverage of this interagency report, 1,700 pages of it, and uh, we should all be quite thankful that it was released on Black Friday instead of prior, for thanks, prior to Thanksgiving, then we didn't have to talk about it. And Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and if you watch the media coverage of this uh, report, I, I, I just think it's been almost irresponsible and, and just terrible. I mean, so if you read the, the media, the so we call the, even the non mainstream media, uh, you read the report, and say, well, we've got in front of us mass death, global food shortages, economic destruction, national security risks, all from climate change. And so the question is, you know, what did the report really say? And why did the media focus on uh, actually the absolute worst case, most least likely scenario? And was that, the, you know, is that a wise way to think about how we ought to work our way out of this problem? So, so I thought what we'd do today is go over some, basic, some basics of where we are on climate, what we observed so far, what the models say, uh, where people are and, and trying to get down to uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees, and then uh, talk about the real world for a little bit. Yeah, we need to do that. I'm so, I mean, it's refreshing to hear you say those things, and I can hardly wait till you, you know, describe what's in the report and how it compares with the, with the media reports. Yeah, yeah. So why don't we start with first, the first uh, slide up here, right? And this slide, I guess it, this slide shows uh, actually where the gap is, you know, the, what we might say is the, uh, what the models are predicting or, sh are, uh, or what the models are generating and what observations to date show. And uh, remember the trend lines of this to 1900. Mm -hmm. And I'm going back thousands of years to the global uh, you know, to the uh, Middle Age warming period and all these other times. We're just looking at a relatively short snapshot in geologic time. I mean, uh, just a minuscule amount, mm -hmm. 1900 to 2100. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this, you can see where, what's happening with observations. And there's some debate there, and, and there's a big band, as you can see, a small band, whether whether we've actually increased our temperature between uh, since 1900 around uh, zero, you know, I mean, the baseline is zero, up one and a half degrees, or maybe less. There's a huge body of literature. For those who are interested in that, that's not my thing. But And then there's this, these forecasts going forward, right, on, a, on a expected temperature change based on the model. Now, what you need to understand about the, the difference in these future scenarios they're driven largely by kind of exogenous or external assumptions. Among them are population growth, right? whether uh, the national economies of the world are uh, dominated by uh, fossil fuels or, or dominated by uh, you know, more industrial processes or more service sector, and how balanced their fuel mix is. But you can see the degree of uncertainty going out to 20. 2100 is quite is quite large, right? mm -hmm. and it's really important to understand that even based in the fundamental drivers, there's considerable uncertainty. Right? Can I ask so, you this, Lou? Uh, so you have a, a pink line which goes higher on the scale, and you have a gray line yeah, which goes so, lower. And I can't 
I can't read uh, on the 90 degree tilt. Uh, what do those two lines represent? So they are different special report emission scenarios from the United Nations. They are very similar, the high one, the absolutely highest one, the high end of the red period is uh, RPC 8.5. Don't ask. That's the, that's the aggressive growth scenario uh, in the climate report, the interagency climate report, which was just issued on Black Friday. So if you're thinking about where did the U.S., where's the media drawing its attention from, it's very similar to the very top end of the red line. Mm-hmm. And that's a so-called so Series A2 special report emission scenario from the UN and the interagency report there. And it's basically a pretty rosy report on economic growth. But the way the climate science works is the more the richer we get, the worse off we are. So you know, that's <laughs> sort of where we go. The more we have to There's lose. Very, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I just wanted to, you know, to understand that this uncertainty is not driven strictly only by kind of the nature of the calculations of the, you know, emission forcing models, but also underlying assumptions in economic growth, population growth, the structure of the national economies. Uh, and so there's lots of uncertainty in this stuff. And we're, we're going to get to why why worst case scenario planning may not be the way to think about problems but let let's go you know let's go to the next uh, picture which shows um kind of a consensus of modeling and uh, on where you know what people have agreed to in paris uh and what the gap may be from what they agreed to and uh, what a lot of the let's say the doomsday monitoring folks want us to worry about, okay, or, you know, responsible people as well. So if you look at this next one, this is the gap between something called nationally determined contributions. That means you showed up at at Paris, and actually it's technically intended nationally determined contributions. And you said, well, I'm China, and I plan to do this. Okay, that was, so you put that in the pot, right? So if everybody in Paris achieves their nationally determined contributions, and which they are not obligated to do, uh, you will lower the uh, emissions from the gray line there to the yellow line. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you can see the total reduction uh, from Paris, for which everyone's a just horrified that Trump pulled, Trump pulled out of, right, has almost no effect. Okay. So Paris is, a, is more political theater than anything else. Okay. You could argue it's a start time. Mm-hmm. But you can see from this graph here the gap in emissions ranges, right? And I think, and this excludes L-U-L-U-C-F, this excludes land use and land use changes in forestry. So you don't in this model, you get no credit for planting trees. Okay, but what I want to say is that the, the thing your your viewers should take away from this chart is that what we've agreed to in Paris versus what you would have to do, at least under the modeling, to get to 1.5 degrees is a big number, mm-hmm. not even close. Okay, so that's the thing. Now let's go to the next one, and I think that this shows you. For the G20, right? The, and the G20 are the, the richest OECD countries in the world, including South Korea, Japan, Argentina, Europe, U.S., Canada. And I think what this shows you here is, you know, what, you know, where where are we in in the whole question of the average change to 19, you know, since 1990, right, mm-hmm. in emissions, right? And uh, emissions per capita, you can see the red line there. That's kind of uh, that's kind of flat. And emissions intensity in the energy sector, right, and uh, has flat. And energy intensity of the economy of the G20 has actually fallen, right. Mm-hmm. Emissions have grown, right, but they have not grown exponentially mm-hmm. because we have become to we've become a less 
a less heavy industry society, more service oriented, and we become more efficient. Right? It doesn't meet the it doesn't meet the objectives of many in the environmental community who want to literally end fossil fuel use by 2040 right? mm -hmm. or earlier. In other words, to meet some of these targets of two degrees, you literally have to stop the use of all fossil fuels in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. That may seem like a not that may seem like a long time because it's a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next. Now you uh, said you said this is the G20 that's meeting in Argentina just in a few days from now. I mean, yes, yeah. Right. Do you think they'll be talking about this report in Argentina? I doubt it, but maybe a little bit. <laughs> I point out that uh, <laughs> in France, I ask anyone who thinks that this stuff's easy to do, look at the riots in France, right? This was only because he decided to increase the taxes on diesel fuel. <laughs> and and when they survey these all the French farmers and the truck drivers and everyone are like stopping traffic and engaging in these massive strikes, they say, well, yes, we're very sympathetic uh, to uh, you know environmental initiatives and improving the environment, but the thing we're really sympathetic about is our survival. <laughs> As, <laughs> I can't argue with that. <laughs> Well, you, you can't argue that, but our politicians sometimes are disconnected. So, And I think you might take a look here at how the G20 is doing on our last picture here on uh, decarbonization, right? And this is from a group, Energy Transparency. It's, uh, it's, you know, no, they're not a bunch of crazy, they're pretty, you know, pretty aggressive and trying to push for, uh, for uh, climate change uh, initiatives. But I think what you can see here is that um, nobody is really engaged in massive coal phase-out, our biggest uh, carbon emitter. And in fact, uh, Australia, China, Indonesia, Japan, Mexico, Russia, South Korea, Turkey, actually they list the United States. I don't quite agree with that. No consideration or policy in place of phasing out coal. Right? I think that's true for the U.S., except the market is driving out coal to our cheap natural gas supplies. Well, I mean, do you think, this so is, that, is this gonna change? That's really remarkable that uh, coal is sort of the enemy of clean, clean energy. <clears throat> is, wouldn't you predict that it will change? Coal will change in the US. <laughs> Keep in mind, uh, the notion that somebody in the US decided to write this big report on a territory, which in which in the United States, which all, and, and they're going to measure the impacts on on a territory which constitutes 1.6 percent of the entire global space, you know, the space of the Earth. It's kind of you know bizarre. Am I? How? Why would anyone think you could do that in any reasonable way? Right? Mm -hmm. You're taking a massive global system and you're saying. Oh, we're so smart. We're going to measure the impact on 1.6 percent of that space. And so, um, I would say, and this is what we learned in our LNG work. And LNG is more expensive than coal. You can go to India. Yes, you're getting some progress in China, mostly driven by local air pollution issues. But in much of Asia, your part of the world, there, the cost of electricity is much more important to the political structure and to the folks living in both democratic and autocratic societies mm -hmm. than uh, concerns over climate, which is not the same as the concerns these populations have over air pollution. Mm -hmm. That's a much different thing. They can see it, they can feel it. So what, what I'm trying to present here is that Yes, the report presents, and I'm gonna, we can talk maybe after the break, I don't know, we can go through, okay, what, how did the, how did, what parts of the report did the media draw on which exaggerated what it actually said? Yes, good question. Uh, let's take a short yeah. break. Lou Pugliarisi, E. Prink in Washington, D.C. will come back and answer that question. This is Think Tank. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness.
Aloha. I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. No, you won't. Okay, we're back with Lou Pugliarisi. This is Energy in America. And we're talking about the um, U.S. interagency climate assessment, re uh, rather climate ass assessment report that came out on Friday, Black Friday. And the title of our show is that report. Is it uh, a real crisis? Is it talking about a real crisis? Or is it uh, a doomsday mongering? <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to see now what the elements of the report are that you could draw conclusions either way. Right. And, and I, I, I want to sort of make, you know, we don't want to make too light of this, but I do think that this is serious stuff. It requires a lot of thoughtful uh, initiatives on the policy side. It, it requires some hard-headed thinking, not just aspirational goals, right? I mean, a lot of people... I mean, we've you know I've been looking at this for many years. We've been and we understand how people feel about it. But just because you feel bad about something doesn't mean uh, you should do you know you should like bankrupt the entire country to do it. You should be thoughtful going for it. So the first thing I would say about the report is that the reporting on it drew upon the most dire economic outcomes. In other words, and actually even those econ those outcomes are not that bad. So. In the report, they said that U.S. GNP would be reduced by, it would be 10%, right, less than, uh, you know, there would be 10% loss in the GNP of the U.S. by 2100. And actually, if you step back from the reporting on that, 10% sounds, low. it's greater than the Great, Reci greater than the great uh, Recession. The U.S. economy between now and 2010 is likely to go grow four times. If you took the worst scenario from this report, it would grow 3.8 times. Okay, so then you might start. That's even the most. That's even the worst one. That's the most serious outcome. Okay, that's bad. But how bad is that really? Right. We grow four times. We go 3.8 times instead of four times. Yes, we, it would be better for us to grow four times than 3.8 times, but we should have an intelligence strategy to do that. It also, and the reporting on the report, only takes the most extreme and least likely climate scenarios. If you go through the whole report, um, it's a theoretic, so it's known as the so-called representative concentration pathway 8.5, okay? And in that one, they use four representative uh, trajectories to project different greenhouse concentrations. But in this scenario that was used, they used the fastest population growth, a doubling of the Earth's population to 12 billion, the lowest rate of technological development, which is something I uh, refuse to believe is going to happen, right? Sl and slow GDP growth, a massive increase in world poverty, which is completely different from what we have ex seen over the last 20 to 30 years and high energy use and emissions. And despite, you know, despite what the climate assessment says, this, uh, this RPC 8.5, it's not a likely scenario. And I, we always say, look, worst case, yeah, worst case scenarios are useful, but do we really want to plan everything in the world you know, from defense planning to dams for only worst case scenarios? If that's the case, we're going to be quite poor. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's some risk we have to accept, right? Well, whether the prognostications are, are true or not, whether the assumptions are, you know, an appropriate yeah. uh, array of assumptions, um, I mean, I, it seems clear to me that we're going to have some kind of negative effect. And, and the negative we effect... We are? Okay. And, and the, so it's hard to put a, a kind of metric on it and it says, well, are we going to lose, um, you know, 500 million lives or maybe a billion lives? Uh, yeah, but how do you, but someone has to decide if we're going to have a command and control or our governments are going to tell us to do something, right? We have to decide how much of our economic wealth and our well-being we're going to put into this, right? We, it's just like anything else we think about in society, right? Big we question to, then, does, to, does the report go into that? 
Does the report say, well, because of these assumptions and these pre predictions, you have to do this, that, and the other thing? Does it say that? Talk about that. It doesn't. We're just describing what we don't make policy. Okay, that's what the report says. It doesn't say, but I, it says that. But I would like to point out that it estimates nearly impossible uh, levels of coal consumption. It takes almost no account of the massive increase in natural gas production from the shale revolution. It ignores any kind of technological innovation that occurred in both nuclear and renewable technologies. And uh, if you go to more realistic things, what happens is, if you look at some of the work by climatologists Judith Curry and some others, if you use a more kind of realistic view, most of the catastrophic outcomes disappear, right? They don't kick in. And, uh, and you know, I think a, a big issue of this is, uh, in the report, they also, I think they overdo it on hurricanes and floods, uh, you know, uh, heat waves and wildfires. We look at current events, right? A few years worth of data, we say, okay, this shows it's, it's all based on climate. Might be a contributing factor. I'm not saying that, but uh, if you look at Professor Pelkey's work, and I think we've talked about this before, he so this is a report he did in August 2017. Shows no increase in drought, no increase in frequency, magnitude of floods, no trends in intensity of hurricanes, and low confidence, right, of climate change, um, and detected in Western United States, right. So I mean, I think, and if you go through this. Uh, you know, and it depends on the, the trend you use, that period of time, right? You can, the framing of heat wave data from the 60s today makes it appear there's been more heat waves in recent years. But, mm. but if you frame wildfire data from 18, 18, 1985, you get the same thing. But if you go back, if you go back 100 years, you don't really see it. So, well, you know, it strikes me that, that, go ahead. Go ahead, Lou. Yeah, go ahead. So I think that that's one thing we need to do. We need to kind of, okay, we, and we go through the report and say, okay, what is a kind of responsible strategy which is robust against the uncertainty? Because just, I think if you try to scare the public all the time with this, with these, frankly, doomsday mongering scenarios, they become inert to it. And they say, you know, this is just like, the old cancer research. Well, everything causes cancer, so I'm just going to have an extra steak today or something. You have got to kind of educate the public on this in a much more systematic way and say, okay, here are the sacrifices worth making, and here are the ones we're not going to make you do. Okay? Because it's not, you know, it's, it's the probabilities are too low. What I, what I don't understand, uh, just about the report in general, is it, as I recall, it came out of the White House. The White House had something to do with releasing it, uh, and yet uh, the president doesn't agree with it. He makes a public statement ye yesterday, day before, well, that he didn't agree with it. So how much credibility should we attach to this? Um, the government is a I, little I tossed on it, no? So I think the report uh, is required to be issued every four years by congressional mandate, right? And it's a process through the interagency process. And the, the, as far as I understand, the White House did nothing with the report. They didn't want to be seen intervening with it. It's okay. They released it. And then Trump does what Trump does. You know, he just makes his comments. I mean, I'm sure he also did not read the report, okay? <laughs> and I don't know if anyone summarized it for him. I mean, there is a technical, rational discussion we can have on climate, but that goes beyond the attention span of people who watch cable news. That is going to be, we're going to have leaders who are going to have to be willing to spend the time to say, okay, look, here's a cost-effective approach to proceed, right? Well, I mean, you know, just the other thing I wanted to mention, Lou, is this, is yeah. that you, you, maybe uh, the, the assumptions um, and the way of, um, you know, presenting this information, making predictions is, is uh, is at the pessimistic end. And maybe it is, mm -hmm. let's assume that it is at the piss. But doesn't that have a role in trying to motivate government, motivate people? Because up till now, you may know more about this, I, I don't know if the government has done very much 
in order to make us more resilient, in fact, more resilient to deal with climate change, either on an optimistic or a pessimistic level. Uh, and and yeah, so maybe there's a purpose in all of this to try to get us excited enough to go to action. Yeah, so keep in mind, since the beginning of time, man has been adapting to climate change. He invented clothes, fire, shelter. Uh, we built seawalls, right, dams. So we're, it's not like we are not trying to adapt to climate. We've been adapting to climate since the Roman Empire. So I, I don't think that the – so the question is, what adaptive measures, if in fact uh, most of these – preventative measures, and you saw from my chart, I don't think, you know, we can wring our hands all we want. We are not going to substantially reduce, we're not going to reduce fossil fuel use to zero in 20 years, okay? I don't care what the UN says. It's not happening. So just wake up and accept that, and then start to talk about what's a responsible adaptive strategy for a range of outcomes, and be prepared with adequate research and stuff for the more serious outcomes should they occur. occur. But that is not a dramatic, religious, uh, all-encompassing, you know, uh, spiritual fight. That's a kind of technocratic solution we use to solve lots of problems, mm -hmm. for which uh, it's not very exciting politically. Don't we need that? I mean, uh, I, I would have, I haven't read the report, and nobody I know has actually read it, although we're going to have a show about the, some of the people who wrote it in a few days yeah, yeah. about the Hawaii chapter anyway. So, but I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better if this report actually included options and alternatives uh, and, took, and took all these findings? I think, yeah, so this is a kind of one of these issues, right, where no, most people do not want to spend their life. You know, you know if you, we talked about this in the last show. The, the climate uh, tax went down in Washington, a very liberal state. It's not one in which the public has been convinced outside of California that a massive amounts of money should be spent on this. So I do think there's a lot of homework for people to do. And one of the things is to even educate the media, because I actually don't think the media reporting really reflects what the scientists think. But actually, most of the scientists are pretty thoughtful, and they've done some serious work. There are members among the community and people who are not scientists promoting different agendas, but that they are not really part of the mainstream thinking on this issue, mm -hmm. in my view. So you have the possibility that um, it's a real crisis. Maybe some of this, um, you know, can be translated into that conclusion. Uh, and others, uh, other parts of it uh, would be, um, you know, uh, doomsday mongering, which is not good for, not good for us either. Right. But what, what is the next step here? It seems to me that there should be somebody waiting in the wings to come out and say, okay, we have read the report and we've analyzed the report and we've, you know, integrated all the possibilities and here are some action points for you in New York, you in Washington, uh, you in San Francisco and, and Los Angeles to actually do now and, and let's get on with it and let's find a, a reasonable way to do it at a cost we can actually afford. Where is that coming yeah, I from? Think so I, I don't know. It's not coming from our current political leadership on both sides of the aisle. But some of the states have promise of doing, you know, responsible things. I think Florida is looking at, uh, you know, you look at Florida, they've changed a lot of their building standards for hurricanes. Um, there's a lot of interesting work being done uh, on uh, sea level rise and subsidence in Louisiana and other places. So, yeah, a lot of this is like local is going to take place at the state and local level. Mm. And probably what the federal government ought to do is, you know, provide some research, overarching research, and uh, maybe some funding and some support for uh, you know, demonstration projects and things that make sense. I, as you know, my own bias is that we spend much too much money trying to put the carbon in the ground keeping it from getting into the atmosphere, and not enough on adaption. Mm -hmm. I would think the adaption is likely to be, that is what mankind has done for 5,000 years. There's no reason to think he can't keep doing that. Well, maybe we ought to put this in the hands of the think tanks, the energy think tanks. Energy think tanks, no, just like your energy think tank, 
And you could write a report putting all this together and giving us a way, a path. What do you think, Lou? <laughs> we don't work on climate. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I asked you how this affected your thinking as a, you know, a researcher and analyst on energy policy around the world, uh, has it affected your thinking so far? Uh, this it, only morning, you know, my, it doesn't really affect my thinking very much at all because I look at the data and I don't see anybody uh, rushing to impoverish themselves <laughs> to meet some problem that's 100 years away. And I do think that, you know, the way it shapes my thinking is, look, you should be putting more money into research and development. You should be looking at some interesting adaption issues. And you should sort of follow Bill Gates' strategy. When the alternatives become competitive, they'll emerge. And the way and what you might want to do is accelerate when they'll become competitive, but put more money into research and development. Mm. But to try to centrally manage the national economies or to wrench them into alternatives that are very costly, that's a, that's a strategy for getting kicked out of office. <laughs> but we have to find one, don't we? We have to find a strategy yeah. that will be useful, that will be manageable, yeah. and uh, that will take yeah. all these points into somehow into account. Otherwise, uh, exactly. it's sort of like, you know what it's like? It's like the frog in the water. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you throw the water, the frog in boiling water, he'll jump out. If you, if you, <laughs> if you just go ever so gradual, uh, that's the end of the frog. So <laughs> we have to remain completely aware and conscious of how these, these, uh, yeah. these things are going. And we'll look to you exactly. for that, Lou. We'll look for you to tell us about it. <laughs> I'll keep telling you about it. <laughs> okay. Lou Pudirisi, yeah. the president, chief executive of uh, EPRINC, uh, think, think Tank uh, on Energy in Washington. Um, and I look forward to our next discussion two weeks hence. Thank you Great. so much, Lou. Thank Aloha. you, Jay. Aloha. <laughs>